It's Friday, March 3. In the headlines, in local news, Tourism Minister says marine and coastal tourism will be the largest sector of the global ocean economy by 2030. In business news, IMF approves US $1.7 billion in funding for Jamaica. Regionally, Guyana mounts urgent review of gaps in laws governing financial crimes. Internationally, Americans are fearful as Joe Biden administration cuts COVID food benefits. In sports, world champion track and field athletes slated to attend GC Foster Classic track and field meet. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I am Maya Chung. Recognizing the tremendous contribution of the ocean to tourism development, Minister of Tourism Edmund Bartlett has called on global tourism stakeholders to play a leading role in adopting and encouraging more sustainable values, attitudes and practices that will promote healthy ocean and marine systems. The call was made earlier this week by the minister as he presented on resilience for blue economy during the Caribbean Maritime University Port Royal Lecture Series. According to the minister, the blue economy is defined by the World Bank as, quote, the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs, and ocean ecosystem health, end quote. We have more on this from Simone Absalom Gale. The tourism minister said that to ensure that the tourism industry plays its part in contributing to ocean sustainability, there needs to be seriousness of intent, purpose and action among tourism stakeholders at all levels to address industrial actions that harm ocean and marine resources. Mr. Bartlett added that such firm commitment to sustainable behaviors and practices is necessary to help preserve the enormous benefits of healthy marine and coastal ecosystems to the economic livelihoods and survival of billions of people globally. Mr. Bartlett underscored that there was a moral responsibility on all industries, especially those that significantly harness or exploit ocean and marine resources in their value chains to make greater efforts to protect fragile and gradually depleting ocean and marine systems that have become increasingly susceptible to a man-made phenomena. These, he said, included ocean pollution, shipping and transport, as well as dredging. The minister outlined that the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has predicted that marine and coastal tourism will be the largest sector of the global ocean-based economy by 2030, generating some U.S. $777 billion in global revenue. Noting that small islands, developing states and other coastal nations were particularly reliant on coastal and marine tourism, Minister Bartlett cited that for the Caribbean, the industry accounts for a quarter of the total economy and a fifth of all jobs. He drew attention to the 2016 study by the World Bank, which estimated the economic value of the Caribbean sea, coastal and marine ecosystems at U.S. $54.55 billion. The minister explained that the areas that attract tourists have been coming under increasing pressure from the damage and pollution caused by tourist facilities and the supporting infrastructure. Against this background, he noted that the blue economy approach recognized and placed renewed emphasis on the critical need for the international community to address effectively the sound management of resources in and beneath international waters. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Minister of Science, Energy and Technology Daryl Vaz says discussions are being held with satellite internet provider Starlink regarding broadband connectivity expansion in hard-to-reach areas in Jamaica. Starlink was given the green light to commence operating in Jamaica in October 2022. Mr. Vaz noted that the entity's introduction has given greater accessibility to areas that are not currently served or are underserved. We have more in this report. 
Minister Vaz said Starlink is a private entity and that it was the Jamaican government that had reached out to the company. Minister Vaz said this in the context of questions being posed at the meeting about whether Starlink has been living up to the parameters of the license, as well as queries to the extent that Starlink had been found to be falling short on delivering on the requisites of the license they were granted by the government. In response, Minister Vaz said the company is a new startup and has been having their issues in terms of rolling out. We have been in discussion with OUR from the ministry. We have indicated to them our dissatisfaction in relation to the service. And of course, they have indicated to us that they are monitoring the situation. And I know from time to time they have discussions with the telecom providers. But as you know, as, I, as you said before, it's an independent uh, uh, regulator, and therefore you have to to keep your keep your your your, your distance uh, in terms of making sure that you don't overstep your boundaries. Uh, those discussions continue, and the bottom line is that we commit to keeping the pressure on from the ministry side to get service up to standard. At the March 2 Standing Finance Committee meeting, Minister Vaz indicated that some 63 sites for the period 2023 to 2024 is the government's aim. In addition, he said other objectives include five community Wi-Fi projects, all with the objective of making the island's internet coverage more all-encompassing, efficient and ubiquitous. So the introduction of Starlink obviously has given uh, great accessibility to areas that are not currently served or underserved. It is a private entity. We have reached out to them. Uh, they have obviously, as a new startup, having been having their issues in terms of getting rolling out, etc. But the intention is to have dialogue with them to see how we can partner with them to try and see if we can cover some of these areas. It's not. It's not. Um, it wouldn't be the first time because the Ministry of Education did uh, utilize satellite uh, coverage during the pandemic um, through a provider, local provider, which worked out uh, very well. As a matter of fact, one of the pilots was in my constituency up in the Buff Bay Valley, which is very challenging, and it had no issue. So that has to be definitively a uh, 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 dis discussion uh, with Starlink in short order to see how we can partner. And I know that USF has already been in touch with them. It's a matter of how and what we can arrive at in terms of um, an agreement in principle to identify. We know the areas. Obviously, USF is very uh, au fait with that. So yes, the answer to your question is that that has to be a part of the plan in terms of getting uh, coverage uh, for the bet better coverage for the, for the entire country. Minister Vaz said the intention is to have dialogue with Starlink principals to see how Jamaica can best partner with the company to see if Starlink can cover some of the deficit areas. On topic, Mr. Vaz said that Jamaica has utilized satellite internet connectivity, citing the Ministry of Education and Youth's use of the tool during the COVID-19 pandemic through a local provider. He said... Quote, I know that the Universal Service Fund has already been in touch with the company. End quote. The technology minister said that it's a matter of how and what agreements and deliverables the government can arrive at in terms of an agreement in principle. Minister Vaz said, quote, we know the areas. Obviously, USF is very au fait with that. End quote. He furthers, quote, so yes, that has to be a part of the plan in terms of getting better coverage of the entire country while we do the national broadband initiative. Meanwhile, the minister informed that Cabinet has approved the national broadband initiative as a national designated plan to come to Parliament. Mr. Vaz says this will allow the government to conclude negotiations with the International Financial Corporation, IFC, regarding the model that the government of Jamaica will use in relation to the procurement, which will come thereafter. The National Broadband Initiative aims to connect every household and community to the Internet. In relation to that, that cabinet has approved um, the National Broadband Initiative as a designated uh, 
national des designated plan to come to Parliament, and that will allow for us now to conclude negotiations with the IFC in relation to the model that we will use in relation to the, the, the procurement um, uh, which will come thereafter. So I would expect it to come to Parliament in short order. It's with the Ministry of Finance now, and after that, we should be in a position to get moving as we have been. The procurement guidelines has kept us going for the last eight, eight, eight to 12 months. And it is now time for the business report with Danita Rodney. The Executive Board of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, has approved over 1.7 billion US dollars in funding for Jamaica under its Precautionary and Liquidity Line Arrangement, PLL, and Resiliency and Sustainable Facility, RSF. The 24-month arrangement under the PLL is to provide insurance against risks from higher commodity prices, a global slowdown, tighter than envisioned global financial conditions and new COVID outbreaks. Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark previously indicated that Jamaica's request from the IMF is aimed at increasing fiscal space and if premised on looking across the horizon given the prevailing global uncertainties coming out of the pandemic and amid the Russian war against Ukraine, which could further impact world economic conditions in the months to come. Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for Thursday, March 3, the US dollar sold for an average of $154.04, the Canadian dollar ended trading at $112.92, the pound sterling traded for $186.34 and the euro sold for $166.82. In GSE trading, the GSE index declined by 1,383 points. The junior market index declined by 13 points. The combined market index declined by 1,416 points and the All Jamaican Composite Index declined by 1,813 points. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 106 stocks of which 40 advanced, 46 declined and 20 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 13A Student Living Jamaica Limited, Blue Power Group Limited and CAC 2000 Limited. Stocks declined for 13A Student Living Jamaica Limited Verba Preference, Access Financial Services Limited, and AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited. Trading firm were Barita Investments Limited, Siboni Group Limited, and Dollar Financial Services Limited. The overall volume leaders were Whitton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with over 6 million units, Dermon Trading Company Limited with over 2 million units, and Trans Jamaican Highway Limited with over 1 million units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, zero securities traded. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, First Caribbean International Bank was the sole security trading 444 shares. In regional business, SO Exploration and Production Guyana Limited says it is hopeful that it will be given the green light for its fifth project offshore Guyana within two months' time. Projects manager Anthony Jackson says the company will move towards the swift development of the project once approval is given. So as I mentioned, Uaru is the proposed fifth development. This is what we call a pre-sanctioned project, as in we have not gotten the production license from the government of Guyana. Uh, that is going to be part of the EIA and receiving the environmental permit. It's part of that process. And then we will engage with the government uh, following the environmental permitting process to understand the production license process as well. And hopefully, uh, in the next month or two, uh, we will achieve a production license for the wrong developments and we will proceed with the project and full speed ahead. When we talk about the scope of this project, you will see up to 63 development wells are being proposed as part of this project. As we continue with the design, detailed design as well as the subsurface refinement. In market data for oil, oil prices dipped on Friday but were poised to register a weekly gain with renewed optimism in China's demand recovery outweighing worries over recession. 
growing U.S. crude inventories and tightening monetary policy in Europe. Brent crude futures slipped by 51 cents to $84.24 a barrel, and West Texas Intermediate crude futures were down 41 cents at $77.75. And that was the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. In regional news, as part of the Guyanese government's commitment to combat financial crimes and money laundering, new amendments are in the pipeline for the current anti-money laundering and counterfeiting financing of Terrorism Act. Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs Anil Nandlal made the disclosure during his weekly program, Issues in the News, on Tuesday. As you may be aware, in Guyana's last risk assessment report, the paucity of convictions has been flagged as an issue that Guyana must address in the area of AML CFT. And we have begun to do that. So you are seeing in the public domain an intensified investigative regime being pursued at the level of the Special Organized Crime Unit. That Will be, that will continue. We have joined on with the RSS late last year to enhance and augment our ability to detect and investigate organized crimes and money laundering offenses. The regional security system visited Guyana recently and engage with various important stakeholder organizations. They engage with SOKU and they have offered technical assistance whenever requested. And they also have said that they will offer um, attachment programs whereby SOKU officers can go to the agency, to the RSS, and do um, attachments with them to enhance their capacity and training. Similarly, they met with the Attorney General Chambers and met with yours truly and have identified certain gaps in the Guyana's AML CFT legislative landscape. We have begun to work immediately in correcting those gaps they have offered us recommendations, and we are working to implement those recommendations in the form of legislative amendments. That is um, work in progress, and soon um, amendments, two pieces of amendments, will be taken to the National Assembly President of the Senate, Senator Reginald Parley, has made an appeal for young Barbadians to get involved in politics. The call came as he delivered a lecture at the Barbados Community College on the role and functions of Parliament. He also spoke of incorporating technology to encourage participation. Democracy is not an inanimate object to be passed on safely in a box from generation to generation. Instead, it is a living, evolving organism that draws its sustenance from active citizenship and involvement with all citizens, you, me, all of us. You students of this tertiary institution that has revolutionized education, you are well placed to make meaningful inputs into the economic, social, and political development of this country. Please do not be a spectator. Be a participant in influencing the present and shaping the future. I think that in relation to um, 
other matters of related to how government, depart how government departments function or don't function, that having a series of online um, meetings to discuss reforms, to take inputs, um, to take complaints. So using the technology as is, we were able during COVID to have um, Parliament online, um, and that the same technology can be used to have more active engagement. The Prime Minister has has started having um, town hall meetings where the government officials are there to discuss and hear directly from the people. Uh, that's just one example. But I think that a lot more part, truly participatory democracy can be practiced. Antiguan Prime Minister Gaston Brown said his administration remains committed to paying an increase to public sector workers once ongoing negotiations are completed. We have more from ABS News. We could have placed public servants on days, but we soldiered on. And notwithstanding that, we're now in a position to give an increase this year. I however caution public servants that they must be reasonable with their demands, recognizing that we have not fully recovered the economy and that the increase that we offer is because of our commitment to empowering public servants with the understanding that possibly, and I'm saying possibly, suggesting that we continue this growth trajectory, that come next year, the government will give serious consideration to a further increase. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Brown says his government's commitment to public sector workers was reflected in increased spending on wages and salaries last year. The figure for 2022 climbed to 423 million, up from 394 million the year before. The Prime Minister says this was due to the implementation of salary upgrades for certain categories of public sector workers, including teachers, and the contribution to back pay made to public servants in December 2022. In news from overseas, millions of Americans are bracing themselves for a significant rise to their monthly food bills. 32 states will end emergency payments for those enrolled in a food assistance program known as SNAP. As Velva Sweezer struggled to feed her family through the pandemic, the U.S. government helped out with $125 a month in food assistance. Now the Biden administration says the emergency is over. And starting this month, the U.S. government is cutting that amount to $30. Yeah, it's going to hurt a lot. It's going to hurt a lot. She's one of 42 million Americans who've benefited from the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. It included an extra pandemic relief supplement that is now ending as the Biden administration rolls back emergency measures. Donald Rogers, who takes care of his 80-year-old mother, is also feeling the pinch. It's, it's a blow. It would cover a lot of food things that we don't have right now, considering she has to pay rent and her medication. Many come here to the food pantry at the Catholic Church's Marillac St. Vincent Family Services. It makes me feel upset because I know that government can do a lot more than what they're doing. Um, and then it makes me feel worried because I know how much our participants need SNAP benefits. I know how much uh, they rely on it. The number of people stopping in for food has tripled since the pandemic began. Now, Tremaine Martin says, they expect even more. On average, benefits will be cut by one third, and that's at a time when inflation is already taking a big chunk and it's expected to affect everyone here. In Chicago, food banks that deliver free to the one in five households that struggle to put food on the table are expecting even more needy people at their door, as food banks have seen in other states that ended the added pandemic era payments earlier. We predict seeing um, an increased number of families going to food shelters um, and uh, food pantries in order to get uh, emergency food so that they can feed their families. For many, it could hardly come at a worse time. Prices are going up. You can't, I mean, how are people going to eat? You're going to have a lot of people out here doing crazy things just to keep food on their tables. So please keep it going. For Velva Sweezer and millions of others, the end of the COVID crisis leaves yet another post-pandemic struggle. 
John Hendren, Al Jazeera, Chicago. In sporting news, a new contract has been awarded to Allied Insurance Company to administer the Jamaica Athletes Insurance Plan. The information was shared by Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport Olivia Grange while she was addressing the Standing Finance Committee. The sports minister says the plan will provide improved and increased benefits for Jamaican athletes. So I'm particularly uh, proud of this area um, of the athletes insurance program and I am willing to provide more details at a later stage regarding this plan. Minister Grange says $40 million was allocated in the 2023-2024 fiscal budget to support the program. She furthers that coverage will also be provided for athletes overseas. Through Allied Insurance Broker and Insurers Guardian Life Limited, providing coverage for Goop Health, Goop Life, cover provided by Surgical Jamaica Limited and Goop Personal, Personal Accident Cover, carried by Lloyd's Syndicate of London, so in fact our athletes are covered when they travel overseas. A total of $97,818 has been allocated to provide support for national sports organizations and federations to host local, regional, and continental tournaments and championships in Jamaica, as well as to provide support for national teams participating in tournaments and champions overseas. And for this financial year, the allocation will also include support for the Reggae Girls and Sunshine Girls. Jamaica's team to the World Athletics Championship in Budapest, hosting of the International Hockey World Cup qualifier, Special Olympics World Summer Games, and the Pan American Lacrosse Championship. Minister Grange also informed the committee that the national sporting policy will be updated to improve the safeguarding of children involved in sports. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Simone Absalom Gale. In more sporting news, the 26th staging of the GC Foster Classic track and field meet will be held on March 11 at GC Foster College. A $100,000 cash prize for the 100 meters and sprint hurdle events are among the major attractions. The likes of World Championship gold and silver medalist Rashid Dwyer, Dimish Gay, as well as Olympic silver medalist Sasha Lee Forbes are expected to be among those in action. The West Indies could not keep up their good performances in test matches as they succumbed to the South African pace attack on day three of the first test at Centurion. Beginning the day on 49 for 4, the Windy Spacers were brutal, dismissing the hosts for 116. Kimar Roach brought up his 11th five wicket haul in test matches with 5 for 47. Alzari Joseph and Jason Holder supported with two wickets each. Chasing 246 for the win, the Windies found themselves grappling at 33 for 5. Jermaine Blackwood was the only ray of light in the final innings, scoring a fighting 79. However, the Caribbean men were flatlined at 159 all out, handing victory to South Africa by 87 runs. Kagisa Rabada, the pick of the bowlers for the home side, taking six Six wickets for 50 runs. At the post-match presser, Jermaine Blackwood noted the choice of shots must be considered moving into game two. I think if we could be a, a bit more selective, um, the way how we went about our business, I think today, you know, we, get, we got out a bit too easy and too soft. Um, I think if we were staying very positive, I think, you know, we, we, we could have get the runs. But, you know, obviously it's, you know, obviously it's something we have to learn and learn fast as well because we're facing against quality bowling. And you know, once we can go out there and just express yourself and put away the bad bars and just, you know, keep out the good bars. I think, you know, we can be South Africa, but we, are, we as a team we have to believe that we can do that. The most senior player on the team, Kimar Roach, still celebrated his bowler's performance. From a bowling perspective, I think the guy did a fantastic job to bring us back into the game, um, giving us a 240 total to chase is it's pretty acceptable. Um, so you know, just as boys got to get, just keep learning, um, remain positive, um, take what we can from this match and just take it into the second match and obviously just give South Africa a good run again. The second and final test match bowls off on March 8th in a Johannesburg. 
And that's the news on PBCJ. I am Maya Chung. You can follow us on our social media platforms at PBC Jamaica. Thank you for watching.